Yes, life size on a silver screen. My heart's desire, my movie queen. I'm so, I'm so, I'm the dream of youth that seems ephemeral and real. A vision floating. Weeks earth and stars, a blessed Amazon stepped out of heaven. Da, 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 da. I'm so, I'm so, tears fall as I sign my name. You're Nineveh, and Troy and Tyre be made of flesh and fire. A vision floating, twixt earth and stars, a blessed Amazon stepped out of heaven. Fabulous, incredible, luminous, marvelous. Twice life size on a silver screen. My heart's desire, my movie queen. I've been criticized for writing a sort of endless autobiography. I don't think this is entirely fair. I think some of the experiences of my characters come fairly close to my own. Some of their reactions come close to my own, but others are miles away from anything that I would do, say, or be. I will be there forever, with my hair falling idly in a white mane across the open window, while you climb, sneaking up through the icy air, to your albino princess, varicose Barbie doll, my rough trade lover, drunk as Chloe on Skid Row, with wet checks in your jeans. What did it take to make a go of it? I think she arrived a bit late. People prefer their writers to be young and promising and 26 and uh, spirited and there uh, on the uh, review pages every Saturday with this sort of bulky lady that turned up at 50 writing this formidable stuff with a dodgy reputation as an ex-communist and somebody whose uh, family life could not be easily summarised in a paragraph. She's an avenging angel. <laughs> she's, she is every poet that's ever existed. Um, in the past, the future and the present. She's the only writer in Australian history and one of the few writers in world history who became a poet of the first rank, a playwright of the first rank and a novelist of the first rank. Never heard of her. Heard the Colleen Hewitt, but not Dorothy Hewitt. Well, I think most of the critics have misrepresented me. I think I've had a pretty hard time from Australian critics, uh, some worse than others. Uh, one critic stated that his aim in life was to get me thrown off the main stages of Australia. No names, no patrol. Um, and in a sense, I think he succeeded. Get rid of the black heathens, she screamed at him. And he did. All of them were in it. The whole town egged on by the wives. And now there's only touch of the tar. I mean, Lily Perkins. To remind him, he got out of hand. The creek ran with blood. Come on, he shouted, grab your gun. I took my telescope and went the other way. Some of them ran over the salt lakes, crying like plovers. They never came back. It was bedlam. And when I looked into my telescope, the dog star was raging to the west. I've always hated the place. Mucking up in? Exiled here like shags on rocks. I was brought up as a child on 3,000 acres of sheep and wheat country near a little town called Wickapin in Western Australia in a place that's called the Great Southern, very romantic name. And I lived there till I was 12 years old with my sister and my mother and father and for quite a long time with my maternal grandparents. And uh, we didn't go to school because if the creek came up, you couldn't get over it. And 
Anyway, the bush school was so little, it kept closing down when there weren't enough kids to keep it open. So we had correspondence lessons from Perth and uh, we led an incredibly free life. There were always lots of books because my father was a big reader and my parents bought us a lot of books. My mother was, I think, a pretty frustrated sort of woman because she wanted to be an interior decorator. And there she was stuck on a farm, miles from anywhere, teaching two little kids. The roof of the hospital cracked like purgatory. At sunset, the birth blood dried on the sheets. Nobody came to change them. The sun went down. The pain fell on her body like a beast and mauled it. She hated the farm, hated the line of wattles smudging the creek, kept her hands full of scones, boiled the copper, washing out sins in creek water, kept sex at bay like the black snake coiled in the garden, burning under the African daisies and bridal creeper, took her children to bed. He lay alone in the sleep out, with a headache and the seven pillars of wisdom. Well, Rodney Fisher once being asked whether I was an innovative playwright said no, I was a very straight down the line playwright. Now, I think that maybe my writing seems to have broken new ground in Australia, but possibly in Europe it would be seen as more or less par for the course. I mean, what I've written, or probably the most innovative writing I've done is possibly on the stage, I think. But that's because Australian drama is still very bound up with naturalistic images in most cases. Therefore, what I did seemed rather extraordinary. Whereas if I'd been living, say, in Germany, it would have just been part of the whole expressionist themes of, of German drama. So it depends very much where you're born. I mean, it's not very hard to be innovative in Australia, let's face it. As for writing prose, yeah, I think I'm, I'm a fairly traditional prose writer, sort of basically realist with dashes of symbolism. Unhooking her sarong, he lowered her naked off a flat rock into the sea. Small fish darted and swam in the golden shallows. He sat on the beach and watched her. When she came out, crawling crab-like up the sand, he looped a necklace of sea grapes around her throat like a rosary. He said they were the only jewels he'd ever be able to give her. I love to watch you swim, he told her. Then I can imagine how you must have been when you was young. He shrugged off his clothes and they lay together, their bodies smelling of smoke and salt, their cries startling the gulls. I think I've always been attracted to two very different sorts of men. One were sort of middle-class intellectual men who came from very much my own sort of background, I guess. And the second lot were working-class men who I always really preferred in a way because I thought they were more adventurous and interesting and because they came from a different world, one that I hadn't known, I suppose. Therefore, I found them fascinating. And they also had plenty of get up and go and plenty of guts. Well, one of the less attractive qualities Dorothy had was that she quite frequently boasted about her sexual conquests, naming names. And uh, um, so there are many Australian men now in advancing years who would either turn in their grave or wince if they knew what Dorothy had said to me about them. Dreams, visions, spells and stories. A crystal palace for a fairy tale Alice. A dolly bird in green. A dream. Alice turned 11, watching the blood trickle between her thighs onto the warm boards 
the wood bugs investigated it. But touching myself on the wood heap, I must be going to die, she thought, and rolled over, staring at the golden light between the boards until her eyes ached, waiting to die. But Nim said, Alice, that's wonderful. Now you can have a baby. People talk about Dorothy as always wanting to be the eternal child, um, young woman. Um, and, you know, there are the images of Dorothy with a headband on and the long hair and the velvet dresses. Um, and I don't know how conscious Dorothy is of, of enacting that particular persona, but it, it is a very complex and imaginative reality that exists in Dorothy's imagination and therefore in her life. And it's like, I guess, a continual quest for youth. Nim flies over rivers and cities, he flies. He is the falcon, small, neat and deadly, beautiful as a stone. With a rush of wings he flies in. When his eyes grow used to the gloom, he sees Alice blinking, perched on the altar rail, sees the vision of her, she gleams. The wind of his coming parts her feathers, her eyes glow. Old snowy owl, he croaks. The candles burn sideways, the wax drips. Under his fierce and dreaming eye, she glistens. She is love. was, of course, the Alice books that I kind of had in the background of my head when I started writing that poetry collection, Alice in Wormland. Uh, and there's quite a lot of material in that, the, particularly the early parts of that book, which deal with the grotesque and the strange in the bush and also deal with mirrors and the reflection back of the self through mirrors which I'm sure comes from that early reading. Later on, when my grandfather's picture show was opened, The Regal, at the top of the stairs, there was a huge ornate mirror going into the dress circle. And I can remember looking in that mirror and I had on a green crepe de chine dress with diamantes around the bottom of it. And I used exactly that image years later in a play called Bonbons and Roses for Dolly, where Dolly, it's, is middle-aged and dowdy and walks through the mirror, splinters it and comes out as the, as the teenager from a sort of Hollywood musical, I guess. The Crystal Palace. Once, ladies and gentlemen, the finest cinema in the Southern Hemisphere. Dunlop pillow padded love seats, bicycle racks, kinky rubber floors, a pram rack and our piece de resistance, the crying room. Unbeatable atmosphere. Thick with memories, verdigris and mildew. The dust rises and you see again those memorable faces. Garbo, Dietrich, Harlow, Hepburn, Crawford, Harpo Marx. I think one of the difficulties with, with all of Dorothy's work is that this, um, that she keeps thinking back to the past all the time, that throughout all her work runs this, this beautiful, blonde, attractive woman in charge of herself and of all her men. And this figure, this idealised figure in many ways, or how Dorothy likes to remember herself, um, irritates a lot of people. Um, I, think, uh, I think people actually think of, if only she would write about other people and be more observant and, let, and call less upon the memory of other people. So all the people in her characters are often seen through this gauze of memory. Uh, and it's a very tangible aspect to a lot of her work. I was so beautiful. Of course, that was in Bundaberg. Come from there. Father had a cane farm. We were quite well off. I had long golden hair you could sit on, and the sweetest dresses. My mother always used to say, White, that's for virgins. <laughs> ah, Tommy. You killed me, Tommy. That wasn't no long golden day. It never rained fivers in Redfern. Just kids and sparrows on the bell of Bundaberg. 
Take your little face out of the mirror, love. It shows me up too much. I came to Sydney in 1949, which was the year of the big coal strike. And I came with this uh, boiler maker called Les Flood, who I'd met in Perth and who I'd fallen in love with. And we had to leave Perth, really, because uh, we were both in the Communist Party and the Communist Party took a very dim view of our liaison because I was married with a child. When Dorothy left Lloyd, I think it's the only time I have never quite understood what she was doing. Maybe I'm brainwashed, I think your kids come first. And I said to her one time, how could you do this? And she said, but I was in love. And that was good enough reason. Leaving my child, my little boy who died of leukaemia afterwards, I think that by hook or by crook I should have taken him with me and faced the inevitable court appearances I may have lost custody of him, I probably would have, but I think that I should have, I should have at least tried instead of being um, intimidated into leaving him behind. We lived first of all in Monka Street and then because I was pregnant and couldn't stay there any longer, we shifted to a house in Redfern and we, we actually squatted in that house. He went to work in Mortstock in Balmain and I went to work in the Alexandria spinning mills. I'd never had a job in a factory in my life before. I'd never lived in the sort of area that Redfern was, uh, which was uh, a slum really. We were both very active in the Communist Party uh, and we uh, lived together for nine years and had three children. Squatting in Marriott Street, the rats behind the icebox, mildew traced varicose curlicks on the walls. The referendum to ban the party was lost, won, lost again. Smoke from illegal literature darkened the autumn air. At the pensioners' hall, they sang the red flag and danced the tango. The pensioners' piss rained through the ceiling. The second baby had eczema. He swore it wasn't his. At the Petrov Commission, Alice was called a spy. Pregnant, pushing a pram under the flags and banners, she marched on May Day. Well, she spoke very much like a rough-hewn, working-class woman. I knew many of them, and Dorothy was like a caricature of one of them, actually, you know, in, in the way she spoke. Uh, Dorothy not only spoke in dropping perhaps G's and H's, but also used foul language, which in my view working-class women don't do, but Dorothy thought that was it. When Dorothy did anything, she didn't do it by heart. When she joined the Communist Party, she became much more Catholic than the Pope, more Stalin than Stalin, more Sharky than Sharky. And uh, she did all the things that the ideal working class communist should have bloody done but didn't. Couldn't get enough meetings, couldn't get enough work to do, you know. She was so, she was a romantic, essentially a romantic. And she romanticised the Communist Party and, uh, and so didn't recognise any of the bastardry that was going on. I was finding it very difficult to adapt to a completely new kind of life. And so there was a kind of... There was a kind of terrible emptiness sometimes, a loneliness. I missed Western Australia much more than I thought I would. I missed my family, I missed my child who I'd left behind. That was the worst part. Um, and I had to keep on doing things in order to be able to fill my life up in some way with all that, from all that I'd lost. When he died, it was like everybody else, in the public ward with the screens around him the big bruises spreading on his skin. His hand came out of the sheets. Don't cry, he said. Don't be sad. 
I sat there, overweight in my Woolworths dress, not telling anybody in case they kept him alive with another transfusion. I think I write in order to make sense of the world. I cannot imagine how anybody can live their life without having some method of doing this, no matter what it is. It may be political, it may be spiritual. In my case, it's by writing. Because by writing, one can stand apart from everything, spin it all into some kind of a spider's web and make at least some arbitrary sense out of it. Each worker is to be rostered on a two or three day basis, thus ensuring no layoffs and some work for all. And would that put us all on bonuses, Mr. Creek? No real cause for alarm. This recession has been caused by an influx of cheap Japanese textiles into Australia, plus a general tightening in the economy and the usual seasonal factors. We are looking for an upturn by the middle of next year. You know, I didn't make you the delegate at the Jumbuck, Mrs. Mooney. Your fellow workers chose you in their best wisdom. Now, I suggest that you start taking a more cooperative attitude towards management. You're not the only one whose job is on the line. The conflict was so great for me between writing and politics that I virtually stopped writing. All I wrote for about seven or eight years were political articles and the odd, very bad poem. And um, what, what I was trying to do, I think, was to turn myself into a political voice. And it didn't sit easily with the sort of writing that came naturally to me. I wasn't a socialist realist, which was what you were supposed to be in those days. I did write one thing, which I think wasn't too bad in those years, and that was a documentary with Cecil Holmes. He sells the Tribune on the job, while the Peggy boils the billy. They're Henry Lawson's army, but they've learned a lot since then. And after all, there is a very simple name for them. They're heroes, yes, but plain and ordinary working men. Every worker correspondent sweating over words at dawn, who tries to sell a Tribune to his mate, knows that words will grow and struggle. From their anger, actions born. They'll bring a mob of battlers out the gate. The streets will be alive with all their songs. The workers marching with their flags unfurled, each one a member of a new brigade. But I also joined an organisation called the Realist Writers, which was a, a left-wing writers' organisation. And there I came into contact with Frank Hardy, the communist writer, who helped me enormously and influenced me a lot in those early years to see that my writing was important because, generally speaking, the Communist Party didn't really pay much attention to writing and intellectuals, particularly middle-class ones, were very suspect. So this was something you had to live down. So as far as the ordinary run-of-the-mill Communist Party member was concerned, or even the leadership of the Communist Party, were not in the least interested in anybody being a writer very much. I had been urging Dorothy to write a novel See, she needed to be convinced that her life in the factory and selling papers and as a suburban housewife communist was an important subject for writing and she should write about it. So I said, why don't you write a novel about that textile factory or some of the women in it? Well, Les Fudd was a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, this developed over the nine years. He became extremely jealous of my writing and probably of me and my background. He had lots of strange ideas and one of them was that my writing was in some way poisoning him. So one day when I came home from work I found all my manuscripts in a drum in the backyard being burnt. But lots of poetry went up in flames and lots of stories 
and bits and pieces of notes and stuff like that that I'd taken. In fact, a whole drawer full of stuff. To this day, I can't even really remember what was there. Anyway, it was all gone. I was delighted when Dorothy uh, developed a relationship with a fellow called Merv Lilly, who was a seaman I knew very well. And uh, I had a feeling that Dorothy was going to marry a lot of proletarians before she died. And if she had to do that, I thought Merv was the one, because Merv was a working class poet and is a working class poet of considerable ability. He wrote an incredible poem called I'll Cut Cain While I'm Able. Dorothy and I agree on many things. We agree on politics particularly. On uh, we, have, we have a lot of same re reactions to all sorts of artistic things. She thinks that I'm very clever, you see. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, when, we, when we get on, we get on, and when we don't, we have some god-awful bloody fights. We have some terrible bloody blues, you know, and um, I'm, I'm not... Uh, it's very unwise for anybody to fight with me. There are plenty of times we've both packed up our bags to leave. Then maybe everybody does that. But we've always unpacked them again for some unknown reason. And yes, and he has affected my writing a lot because I think what my writing needed and had to a certain extent already got through having lived in Redfern and lived with Les Flood and mixed with a whole lot of working class characters. But what it needed was, a, was more, was a wider view of the world than I already had. And he gave me that. I had this problem, you see, Dorothy, when Dorothy's working, everything has to be done the way Dorothy says. And when I'm working, everything has to be done how I say. And so I made some remarks about this at one stage to Dorothy, you know. I think I referred to her as a termagant in the kitchen. And she said, right, well, you're, you're in the kitchen from now on. And I have been ever since. You know, it's a funny world. I always seen myself retiring from a job, settling down to my old age. Me and Laurie on the pension with maybe just a bit extra on the side for me greyhound dog. Often when I'd be coming home from work of an evening and I'd seem to be meeting myself years hence, coming back down them steps from the pensioners all with the sparrows twittering round me head and all the red from spread out in front of me. The first, I suppose, serious play that I wrote was this old man comes rolling home. I wrote it first, the first act, while I was still living in Sydney, but Les Flood burnt it. So I had to start again and rewrite it. Let me tell you a few home truths, seeing as it's honesty week. I'm sick of being the slushy round here, cooking the meals, washing the dishes, sweeping the floors. Changing the nappies on that poor neglected bubba there whilst Pet does nothing but moon in front of the cosy and you does nothing but moon on your dirty old sofa. One of my biggest regrets is that I took so long to start writing again after that long period when I was silent. I used to feel very angry about this and think that if I hadn't joined the Communist Party I would have gone on writing from the time that I was 22 onwards without a break. But of course, I have no way of proving that this is true. And anyway, I would have missed out on a whole lot of experiences, which I would never have known about. Graham Bundler said that, that, that the APG didn't find her political enough and the, and the Melbourne Theatre Company found her too political. But in a way, uh, it's only in things like Bobbin Up and uh, This Old Man Comes Rolling Home that you really let the politics come through. Oh, why don't you pay attention, mate? You never pay any attention. Self first, self last, and self in the middle. I'll get very lonely. Oh, I know you pee in the bath, and worse, pushing it down the plug hole. I spray out every morning with aerosol. There's no mistake in that odour. We've all got to make an effort. 
So why not you? Have another bonbon. Shh. Who's that woman shushing? Me. She shushing me, mate. Whew. Like her cheek. And I was keeping me voice down on purpose. Too considerate. You get no credit for it. Cheek. Might as well talk at the top of your lungs and rustle your bonbons flat out. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Quick, mate. Fasten your fly. Oh, God, you're a dirty old man. But we're all human. We got our finer feelings. We're all human. Are we, mate? Mate. Mate! Never known him sleep so sound before. Mate. Picture's finished. Time to up to Daisy and off to Betty Vice. Mate. Mate, something dreadful's happened. I've had a flood in. All over me new watch and tongue. Oh, I've never been so humiliated. Never. Who'd be a woman? Who'd be a woman? My plays have always seemed to engender the most extreme reactions of either hate or love or general sort of emotional upset. I'm not quite sure why this is. It must be that they hit some nerve or other, I guess. When I played Bonbons and Roses, opening night, I think if I remember correctly, the 4th of October, 21 years ago, I didn't realise just what a furore it would make. The first act went off absolutely, just like a bomb, and then I appeared in the second act, and of course you forget that 21 years ago we didn't swear, at least not to the extent we do nowadays, and we certainly didn't discuss a great many subjects that I, in particular, seem to be discussing. And um, quite often, almost every night, it always seemed to me that it would be a woman in white who rose up what always seemed to be the front row and would storm out, bashing the doors back and saying to the usherette very loudly, I'll never go and see another play that Margaret Ford is in again. This was the first and rather chilling experience I had as a professional director of the violence that a subversive play can actually engender. I also was the recipient, as were other members of the company, of obscene letters. I mean, letters that well, it takes, it takes a lot to make me blush, but I had some really quite violent letters from members of the audience uh, abusing me for putting on the play, abusing Dorothy for writing the play. Uh, in some cases, they were so carried away that they actually uh, forgot and Put, wrote their addresses on the tops of these letters, so we had to warn some of them that we'd hand them over to the police if they didn't lay off. The next play that went on of mine was The Chapel Perilous in the Opera House, uh, for then the old Tate. And it had such a hostile reception from most of the reviewers and from large sections of the audience that I began to realise that I had been living in a bit of a fool's paradise if I thought that, you know, Sydney was so with it that, um, that I'd be accepted. Critics. Well, the less said about critics, the better. The trouble with and critics of his generation, there were not too many Australian plays around and the Australian accent was really harsh and they didn't like to hear it. It was all right to listen to journalists in the pub telling jokes and perhaps hear real people on the street. But to have people talk like that on stage was just not acceptable. She was seen as, a, as far too raunchy a character at various times for uh, the Pram Factory, which was developing its own line of political correctness at the, uh, during one period. And um, uh, the sort of... Uh, uh, promiscuous opulence of Dorothy's personality was a bit uh, a bit rich, I think, for some, and certainly very scary for the uh, the Scottish uh, Rechabites that uh, were running the Melbourne Theatre Company at that time. They'd made love in the room sometimes, many times, with words, naked, 
cunt cock sucking, holding his balls, feet, thighs, joints, joined, holding him, sliding to bliss. The city spread below them, deluged with rain. Harbour of yachts and launches, rocking, sailing beyond the heads, the water rushing, darling, between her thighs. Yes, 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 yes. Well, all my life there's been two people. One was the person that lived and the other was the person who watched. And the person who lived or was always aware, even in the most dramatic moments, even in the middle of a love scene, oh, this will be good to write about, uh, or bad, or whatever. So I think, and I think most writers are like this, they're divided people. And there's always somebody standing beside you as an actual individual, taking it all down in your head. And it makes you a pretty, what? Fairly cold and brutal person in some ways, I think. Because, you know, who wants to be, be in a huge clinch with somebody while they're thinking, you know, this will be so nice to put on page seven or something. She's a great recycler, Mum. She recycles an enormous number of characters and events, and herself, for that matter. Um, you might say she is the most recycled of all. And that, I think that bugs pretty well everyone in the family to some degree. Well, it doesn't affect me very much because I don't read it. That's, that's a good policy if you live with another writer. Don't read what they've written. It's their business, They're absolutely, you see, and uh, it's, it's not that anybody should be interfered with in, in what they write. So I, I don't read it, and that's a fact, you know. Libel, libel, from the Adelaide Advertiser to the Bible. If it mentions me or you, someone's going to be in the booth, and we all can make a fortune out of life. The main trigger for the series of libel actions that my family and I took was a poem in the anthology Rapunzel in Suburbia, uh, which was called Uninvited Guest. But there was another one collateral to it also, which was almost as bad. And really, it just completely ripped off me and my two children, who were then teenagers, and my wife. Sort of general, totally unfounded allegations that I was suffering from some congenital disease. All, all untrue. My wife had been castrated, that my daughter was, a, was autistic and that my son was a delinquent. They were pretty tough, those last two. They were only, only children. They were only 12 and 13 at the time. It was extremely cruel. I was uh, spending a Saturday morning with her and she said, uh, she, she walked in and with a flourish, she threw this paper on the bed said, read that. And I read it and said, well, you won't be able to publish that, will you? And she said, we'll see. And then I ran into Dorothy at some function. I think that was the last time I ever spoke to her and told her that uh, in no uncertain fashion that, uh, that I found the poem poisonous and told her that she better not publish it uh, anywhere else. But she took no notice of me. And of course, when it came out, in that book, in a, in a paperback and a hardback, I really had no option but to sue. Oh, well, the plays, they were sort of secondary. Though. Having, as it were, unsheathed the sword, I didn't put it away until I'd cleaned up the whole mess. Well, Lloyd Davies should have known what anyone who enters into an intimate relationship with a writer should know that one day they are going to be written about by that writer. People did rally around that because we were outraged that somebody was uh, sued for a line in a poem. It seemed extraordinary. Nevertheless, the law won and she had to pay damages out of court. And with the result of that, I think it's Tatty Hollow, Chapel Perilous and um, five poems can never be uh, said or mentioned just because of the alleged <laughs> of her first husband. I mean, we have a laugh about it. <laughs> I think what happened to Dorothy alerted a lot of artists to the, uh, well, not only to the problems uh, of defamation, but the very notion of defamation. Uh, people, I think, at that stage had just sort of uh, blundered on regardless, uh, not worrying about anything. But it, uh, it turned a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, actors and writers into bush lawyers very quickly. 
Uh, they used to say if you scratch an actor, you uh, you find an accountant. But uh, certainly, the, after Dorothy's experience, if you um, if you scratched a writer, you very quickly found a solicitor. It's about 15 years ago. I I was invited to Perth uh, to a writers' week to and to give a lecture on Dorothy, and so I felt very honoured. And I rolled up to do this, and there were two people sitting in the front row heckling throughout the lecture, and I was a bit thrown by this. I didn't know who they were, and. Uh, Apparently they were Lloyd Davies and his wife, whom I'd never met. And I was really quite shocked that after all these years they were still angry. Um, I talked to them later and, and they were quite pleasant, but they really couldn't bear to hear anything said about Dorothy. With pride, the Crystal Palace presents a family show, drama, romance, suspense. And greased lightning action shot through with happy, healthy laughter. Dorothy had shown me uh, uh, a sort of idea at an early stage of a, uh, of a play she was working on with Robert Adamson, which was based on his uh, book, uh, I think, called Zimmer's Besse, which was also co-written with somebody else uh, some years before, and it dealt with Adamson's rather uh, bizarre uh, life in, in the prison system. And... Um, it was a very romantic piece uh, about the discovery of poetry uh, by this, this young man who'd lived a very delinquent life uh, and uh, a most extraordinary piece about the nature of love in, in hard places. I became very fascinated with this book and I kept on thinking what a very good play it would make with eight male characters and I thought, now this would be a change. They say I can only write about women. What if I write this play with Bob um, with eight characters? And I'd never really collaborated with anybody before and so I wasn't sure how it would work. I'd talk and she'd write it down and and then she'd, she'd give me uh, sort of 20 pages and say, look, this is what I'm, I'm going to um, use this. If you, if, you, if you want to change it, change it. If not, don't. And so, of course, I'd, I'd rewrite some of it and on it would go. These, these collaborations sort of lasted for years, years and years. It really mucked me up for a few weeks. But think about it, it only lasted for about four hours. The pain only lasted while they was on top of me, and that was because they was clumsy. And look at, it, look at it this way, right? I hadn't changed, and how had it affected them? I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. You think, you think that was really something, don't you? Really tough, really animal. And you haven't got a clue because they was more screwed up now than you feel now. They and the, and the yahoos in the, in the yard, but they're nothing. And they know it. And so does everybody else. They're just fucking hollow men. Think about them. They're probably going to get married. What happens when someone says the word queer? Oh, not me, not me. They'll be screaming, but not out loud. Oh, you can bet on that. Not out loud. They'll have their own wiggy prosecutor and a, and a greasy defence counsel inside them. And your face and your bloody ass for exhibits. When I grow up, I will be a famous writer and a famous actress and live in a mansion called Fairhaven on the banks of Lake Stilfarden. I will never marry, but I will have many lovers and many children and many servants to do the hated housework. In the evenings, I will lounge on a crimson velvet divan in the red resting room receiving my lovers and the other celebrities in a cloud of incense under the wavering light of the candelabra. From the early 70s right through to now, um, she had this marvellous big house and it could be, lots of people could be there at any stage. Often we'd turn up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, Dorothy would be still writing and so we'd start playing records and or I'd take a musician with me and we'd start playing uh, music and then Merv would get up and, and Dorothy's daughters would get up and you know five o'clock in the morning about 30 people there raving and and people thought this was all pretty insane and, and decadent but really it wasn't it was really a rough draft for our work all these things existed for our poetry and for, for Dorothy's plays. It was like an alchemical house and, and the alchemy was changing the wild scenes into, into art, into, into work. In this romantic house, each story is peeled for rapists, randy poets and their lovers. 
Young men in jeans play out seductive ballets, partner my naked girls. Scripts by Polanski, Russell, Nabokov. Black butterflies fly tandem in the garden. The golden ball is tossed to make its shadow. Tired of loving men who love my daughters, I wrinkle, waiting for a prince. The competitiveness that she felt for her younger daughters was uh, an interesting factor, I think. She hated being old, she hated being middle-aged. She wanted to be, roughly speaking, Kim Novak forever. Nim, drunk, in the cafe of peace. You're old, and I don't lust after you. She's young, and I lust after her, it's only natural. Stony words fall on, white room, white bed, white flesh, blurred glass. You are so beautiful, Nim says, the shower running. She says she based the character of Nim on me, um, and I suppose she did. Um, I find it very difficult to, uh, to relate to, 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 not to the character, but to, I read it as poetry and, 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 it's, and, and it's, a, it, it's a distraction to me to think that it's about me. I, I, don't, I think it's much bigger than that it's my, and that the, the poetry is so, so, um, so uh, powerful and, and unique that uh, what it's based on gets eaten up by the actual imaginative power of her creative process. So there'll be aspects of whoever she bases things on in all these uh, particular characters, but they're much more than the characters and much more than the people they're based on. No one has ever loved an adventurous woman. Is actually a pinch from a nice nin. I think in a certain sense it's true in that people find it difficult to love somebody who is centre stage and they really want to be centre stage. And I think this must be very difficult for men who've always been sort of the centre of the universe, more or less, to suddenly be asked to share this centrality with a woman who sees herself as just as important, if not probably more important than they are. Therefore, in that sense, I think it is difficult to love an adventurous woman. Besides, you never know whether you've got her or not. She's sort of there one minute and then she's gone. And um, this, I think, is very hard too. When you think about these things as past and as present and uh future and everything else, you know, and you find yourself living in a certain way. And you know that that's, that's how you're going to keep on living. So, you know, you know what the score is, you know where you are. That's about it. And there she goes, the popsy with the sad voice, stumbling through history. Nobody sleeps with her now. She has sent them all packing. Or is it just that nobody wants her sad old body? I'm experiencing old age very hard. Uh, physical strength and beauty has always been very central to my life. To lose it, I think, is difficult for anybody. And I also find it very difficult to face the fact of death, to be just snuffed out because I'm an atheist and therefore I have no way of comforting myself about all this. Um, so I suppose the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is first of all to grow old and secondly to die. In the mornings, freight trains shake the garden, peak hour traffic. White cockatoos flicker like ghosts clamouring on a dark sky. In the afternoons, ambulances howl, doves murmur, the children are let out of school. And suddenly it's evening. The fires are lit, nobody comes, and we are living in the mountains with nothing left to say.
fated to spend a lifetime to this end, this shadow sentence. I put a deadlock on my door, repair my fences. Writers are like cats alive with watching. I recreate a kingdom blue with light, shadows massed up, deliberate, translated, each leaf a thread beating beneath the skin, like careful breathing, late at night, in a dark room, in a pool of light. I can still close my eyes and remember 